Back in May of this year, shortly after having moved to the UK, I released a review of Sayonara Wild Hearts. It was one of my first videos using my current, far superior review editing style, and it was one of my more passionate videos as well. Not many people talk about this game, but I really did enjoy it, so I wanted to give it the review it deserved. But I didn't. I gave it a 4 minute simple review, and at the time, that's what I felt was the right amount of time to discuss the game properly. But how wrong I was. This game deserves a lot more than 4 minutes. That's the truth, and I only realized that after playing it over and over again the next few months, religiously listening to the soundtrack and digging into every detail of the game's creation. At that point, I had realized that the game was more than a fun little indie knockout, but was rather one of the most fun, polished, creative games I had ever played, and by far the most criminally underrated piece of media that I could remember. I saw the beauty in every single part of the game, becoming more and more enchanted every time I would think about one of its many unique aspects. This game may not be the longest, most innovative thing out there, but it packs a punch when it comes to having its own ideas. Unlike the countless annual franchises and genres that are continuously bogged down by cliches, Sayonara Wild Hearts invents practically every single thing it has completely by itself. Nothing about this game feels like it was directly torn out of another game. Outside of the occasional intentional reference, like the Mario Mushrooms and Forest dub, this game really makes huge strides to stick out from the crowd, and it really succeeds. But I can't just continue to tell you how unique the game is over and over, because I'm pretty sure you get the point. So I'll be breaking the game down into four different segments. First, I'll talk about the graphics and visual style. Then, I'll go into detail about the gameplay and mechanics present. After that, I'll go over the story, and then I'll review the music of the game which is possibly its most important focal point. The graphics of Sayonara Wild Hearts are beautiful, and I don't think you have to hear me explain how. I mean, just look at it. The game doesn't fail to deliver on bringing great, wonderful visuals to the table, and yet it also doesn't follow any of the more typical methods by which other games achieve amazing graphics. Take, for example, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, Spider-Man Miles Morales, and Last of Us Part 2. All of these are games I reviewed at least once, and I can confidently say that these are some of the best visuals out there. And in my personal experience, these are always the games I think of when I think of cutting-edge, beautiful visuals. And similar to Sayonara Wild Hearts, you can agree with me just by looking at them. But there's also a big difference here. Can you guess what it is? That's right! These three games either have a real life style or a realistic cartoon style. On the other hand, Sayonara Wild Hearts is nothing if not unrealistic. The game does have mostly human characters, but it's not trying to look like real life and it's not trying to look like a Pixar movie either. It's trying to look like... Like... Uh... Honestly, I have nothing I can compare it to, and that's how it succeeds. With most other art styles, even the best ones, I can easily draw a line between them and a handful of other games that use something similar beforehand. But with this crazy game, I find it literally impossible to compare it to any other game out there, which says volumes about how effective it captures its own creative lightning. Now, if you know me, you know my favorite colors are purple as well as blue. And guess which two f colors are at the forefront of this game's style? That's right, blue and purple. So I might be a little bit biased, but even if those aren't your favorite colors, you still have to admit that this looks absolutely stunning. I've talked a lot about games like Days Gone, Detroit Become Human, The Last of Us, Rise and Zero Dawn, Rift Apart, Last of Us 2, Celeste, Spider-Man, Spider-Man Miles Morales, Astro's Playroom, Ghosts of Tsushima, Pokemon Ground Tundra, Age of Calamity, Sackboy, Splatoon 2, and Streets of Rage 4, and said that they all have great visuals, but this is a game that has visuals in a way like nothing else. The graphics here not only look generally really nice and polished, but also distinct. 
that's why I love them so much. Not because I can play the game and feel like I'm in real life, but because I feel the opposite, as if I'm being pulled into another, more abstract dimension. Each level has a completely different look, location, and feel to it. The game is constantly moving you from one phenomenal backdrop to another, and they also all feel perfectly intertwined with how you can interact with them through gameplay. Sayonara Wild Hearts has quite possibly the most bewildering, insane, and difficult to explain gameplay I've ever seen, but in a good way. The game has so many different mechanics, ideas, and experiences in store for the player, while still having a very linear and narrow style that doesn't try anything too crazy in terms of basic design. The game is set up like a long musical album, with 23 different levels present, and each one containing an original song. Eight of these, around one-third of the game, are lyrical performances ripped straight out of a pop album, and we'll get to those later, but for now, let's talk about the gameplay that you experience alongside the music. Sayonara Wild Hearts combines wild platforming action with 2D shooter segments, driving segments, QTEs, and simplistic combat that relies on your ability to keep with the rhythm of the game. It's truly unlike anything else and constantly throws new ideas at you, but thankfully gives each of them enough time to sit well with the player. One level you're riding a skateboard through a trippy road in space, then you're flying through a portal on a giant tarot card, then you're fighting David Bowie with comically large swords on a motorcycle, then you're riding a magical deer, then you're on shrooms, then you're fighting a robot wolf monster, then you're fighting a pair of VR goggles, and then you're shooting a giant hell demon with a bow and arrow. And that's all in one game! This is truly one of the most brilliantly creative pieces of media I've ever seen. And it never fails to surprise you with something insane. It constantly shoves ridiculous mechanics and ideas in your face, and yet it does it so graciously that you never question what's going on. You will feel confused while playing this game, but the mechanics are perfectly balanced so that you won't be confused as to what you're supposed to do, but rather how the hell they even made this. That's why a one hour game has gotten me 12 hours of playtime. I've been constantly replaying levels, even just singular ones, because of the magical experience present and how memorable every single track here is. Another thing that makes the game so fun to play is the side content. You have bronze, silver, and gold ranks that you can get for each level, and some of these are really hard and daunting at first, but after you finally reach gold, you'll look back on yourself and wonder how you possibly failed so many times. And that's something else very effective, the progression. Even though this is a short and simple game, you really have a satisfying feeling of getting better and mastering the game which is always an idea that adds more playtime and enjoyment to anything. And yeah, after all that time playing this game, I reached gold rank on every level. I normally wouldn't do that for a more linear, arcade-style game that can be as challenging as this, but the way it's so accessible and does such a great job gradually raising the bar for difficulty allows it to be one of the most mesmerizing experiences once you've finally mastered it completely. In addition to this, you have the Zodiac Riddles, which are cryptic achievements. You not only have to get the achievement, which can sometimes be so hard that you don't even need the extra challenge, but you also have to figure out exactly what the riddle means first. It's a unique little addition that they didn't have to add, but it's nice that they did, and it's great for the true adrenaline junkies out there. The only other bit of side content is the challenge modes. Album Arcade and YOLO Arcade. Album Arcade basically just allow you to play every single level in one continuous run. So it's a nice feature, but nothing huge. YOLO Arcade, though, makes it so that if you die once in the whole run, you have to start all over again. This is absolutely insane, and I haven't even attempted this, but with how motivated this game makes you to keep trying, maybe I'll do it one day. The gameplay of Sayonara Wild Hearts is not some revolution that will shock the gaming industry to its core, 
but it contains so many awesome ideas, such amazing pacing, so many gorgeous set pieces, and phenomenal mechanics that that is no big deal at all. One of the other things about it that is very different from anything else out there, though, is the story. Sayonara Wild Hearts houses a very different kind of story than I would normally talk about. Rather than filling up tons of cinematic cutscenes with tense action and expository dialogue, it uses the experience of the gameplay to build a plot. The game is laid out in a structure of having five different enemies for you to face. The Dancing Love Devils are the first group, and you face them in the very long, absolutely wonderful level Begin Again, then followed by the Forest Dwelling Howling Moons, the Stereo Lovers, Hermit 64, and Little Death. Each group has its own unique personality and identity, which are shown without a single bit of dialogue, but rather how they fight the player, the weapons they use, and how they move across the level. Each set of levels is easily recognizable as a result, and though they don't really stay for a very long time, these villains do a great job injecting some personality and character into the plot. The basic setup concerns the fact that three divine deities named the Arcana have been attacked by the villains of the game, who have stolen all harmony that lies in their world of the Arcana and hidden it within their hearts. You play as the fool, who begins as just a girl in a Swedish town, but after she goes through heartbreak, she's transported into the world of the Arcana and becomes the hero of that world. After saving that world, she has a newfound confidence to continue on with her life and become stronger than her own emotions. It's a very simple story at first glance, and during my first playthrough, I didn't even really pick up on any of the plot. But after really, really digging deep, I've realized just how well it tells a unique, emotional, and meaningful story that is entirely its own. The theme here is truly focused on self-doubt as well as self-acceptance. At first, the girl doubts that she has any ability. She probably feels lost, alone, hopeless, and weak. We can infer this without really knowing it due to how the change of her attitude happens through the course of the game. She eventually begins to realize her true self-worth and uses it to save something so much larger than herself. She may have failed to achieve happiness at one point in her own world, but this abstract construction of the highest level of powerful deities shows her that she still has more abilities than she realizes, and that she has the potential to do so many good things for others. This is a really good message for people to see in a game, and it really resonates with so many of us, because it's not uncommon for one to feel weak in the face of insurmountable, brutal odds, but this story reassures us that it's okay to fail, because eventually, with enough patience, we'll find our own way to succeed. Each and every level having a unique feel, and the game containing so many different villains, doesn't prevent it from having a solid scope. It feels like it balances having a solid story that surrounds the whole experience, and also having a unique piece of that story that works independently in every level. With unique characters, levels that properly distinguish themselves, uplifting and thoughtful themes, and a fantastic method of storytelling that keeps things simple, but remains very effective nevertheless, the story of Sayonara Wild Hearts may not immediately stick out to you, but after enough consideration and time, it truly becomes one of the best stories out there for an indie game. But now that we've talked about the graphics, gameplay, and story, which are all important, but nothing in the face of this next topic. It's time to talk about the music. The music is, unlike in most games, the most important aspect of Sayonara Wild Hearts. So let's dig into it. The music of Sayonara Wild Hearts is just straight up amazing. One of the best video game soundtracks of all time, which makes sense because the game was built to function as a game and as an album. The overall style is for sure pop, which is not bad. Pop is weird because I've heard tons of complete garbage pop songs, but when it's mixed with elements of other genres, I find it to be some of my favorite music. The songs here really remind me of my favorite musical group, Churches, and that's part of what made me love the soundtrack as much as I do. Quote, We have a collaborative playlist on Spotify. You would find Taylor Swift, 
Carly Rae Jepsen, Charlie XCX, Churches, some K-pop and J-pop. We just drag and drop songs where we felt like they fit. The textures in this song or the melodies in this song, end quote, is a quote directly from the composer of the soundtrack, Daniel Olson, which was received by NPR, so credit to them as well. It shows that the soundtrack had pulled many different inspirations, which allows it to achieve something great. You can listen to it and think to yourself, that sounds familiar, while also feeling like it's perfectly unique. This means that many of the different songs never really get boring, and they fit with the levels perfectly. If there's one thing it does extremely well, it's fitting with and helping to amplify the gameplay. But there's only so much I can say in general, so let's break down each of the lyrical songs and rate them from 1 to 5. Now keep in mind this is my personal opinion, and I've never reviewed music before, so if any of these ratings are at odds with your opinion, please don't take offense. We begin with Sayonara Wild Hearts, the song that plays during the opening title of the game. It's a short but sweet song, but really is helped by the great opening sound which feels like distorted and very unique. I really like listening to it, and it also opens up the game very well. Five out of five. Next up is Begin Again, the song he used for the main confrontation level with the Dancing Devils, and the first longer song of the game. This is a great song that has a nice slow build-up followed by a graceful and powerful finish. It's really good, but does go on for a bit too long for me to listen to it very consistently. 4.5 4.5 out of 5. Then we have Dead of Night, the song used for the Howling Moons confrontation. It feels very action-packed and fits very well with the trippy forest setting. It's perfectly balanced with being uplifting, groovy, and mysterious. It fits well with the level as a whole and has a perfect length. 5 out of 5. After this, we have Mine, used for the Stereo Lovers. This is my favorite song in the whole game, and it has the perfect amount of pretty vocals, awesome background music, and more distorted sounds. It's very quick and does a great job of being fun, entertaining, and amazing. 5 out of 5. The World We Knew is a very slow song used for the part of the game that many people hate, but that I personally like. It takes its time to set everything up, and then comes crashing down with this emotional, beautiful chorus that gave me goosebumps the first time I listened to it. It's, to sum up in one word, powerful. Though it is a bit too slow sometimes, and could use a few extra interesting bits of background music. This is a great power ballad song. 4 out of 5. Inside, the theme used for Little Death is a song that really had to grow on me. At first, I thought it was just alright. But now I enjoy listening to it, and though it doesn't have the most interesting instrumentals, it has enough of a unique feel and sound to it for me to forget that. This is a solid song, but it isn't perfect. 3.5 out of 5. Now keep in mind that with these scores, I'm comparing them relative to the other songs in the game, not in general. If this was in general as songs, these would all be getting 5s, so keep that in mind. After this, we have Wild Hearts Never Die from the final level with the same title. It's a great song, no doubt, with a wonderful, unique sound, powerful vocals, and overall an amazing pace to it. I really enjoy it, but it does feel a little bit more simple than some of the other songs, and maybe could have had a few more layers to it. 4.5 out of 5. The final song in the game is A Place I Don't Know, which plays for the ending credits and is a very beautiful song played on guitar with slow, pretty vocals. It's a great way to end off the wild ride you've experienced and allow the powerful message of the game's ending to resonate with the player. I really love this song. It's slow, but very nice to listen to. 5 out of 5. Now, before I close this out, I want to give a huge shout out to Samogo for making this wonderful game, Daniel Olson for making the amazing soundtrack, and Linnea Olson for performing the phenomenal vocals for said soundtrack. And I recommend you all check out her album, Ah, which is fantastic. Sayonara Wild Hearts contains one of the most visually distinct and beautiful art styles I've ever seen. A fantastic set of crazy mechanics, which help every part of the gameplay to stick out. A powerful story that is told concisely in very few resources. 
and a phenomenal pop soundtrack that stands on its own as a fantastic set of songs. This is one of the best games I've played from the last five years, and is by far my game of the year for 2019, hands down. It's an amazing game overall, and possibly my favorite indie game of all time. Play this game now, please!